Hello and welcome to our live talk today with Conservation Without Borders. My name is Kathleen and I run the communications for Conservation Without Borders. Today I am joined by our CEO, Sasha Dent, as well as we've got two Osprey experts, Simon Curtin and Tim McCrill. We're going to be talking all things about the tagged Osprey 4K and if the team managed to find him in Guinea. Um, so, guys, if we could hand over to you first, Simon, maybe if you could give a bit of a brief introduction to yourself and um, how it fits in with you. OK, fine. Um, well, I've been a bird watcher and a lover of wildlife all my life. Um, I first saw my well, I saw my first osprey with my wife on holiday in Scotland, Loch Arcade in 1988. And uh, since that time, I've really been fascinated by them. Um, I live where I live in the, the East Midlands. We never thought we'd actually get to see ospreys um, at all. But in 2014 uh, one was seen in the area and that put me in touch with Tim and then from then the rest is history really um, uh, you know it was 4k was the bird that we saw in 2015 here for the first time and uh, we've been following uh, and, uh, my wife and I've been following ever since that that day really every time he was uh, in the area and uh, you know this year he finally made it if you like <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we'll go into a bit of detail about that as we, as we go along. But Tim, if you could give you give us a brief introduction as well. Yeah, so um, I I now work with the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation, but for many years I ran the uh, Rutland Osprey project. So yeah, I met Simon in 2015, or, or was it the year before? I can't remember. Um, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Because we were really looking to kind of encourage the Rutland Osprey population to spread out. And so we were looking for sites to build artificial nests. And the Beaver Estate basically lended itself to that. And Simon, being local, was really keen to help. So we um, we put a nest up, which was um, September 2015. And, you know, here we are several years later with a with a really nice story to tell, which is exciting. And, and Tim, as I understand it, you were part of 4K getting tags um, initially. That's right. So, so back in... Um, um, 2018 it was the 5th of August that year we um, basically we've we've done quite a lot of satellite tagging of ospreys in the UK now and in fact I was lucky enough to do a PhD on it so we've got a lot of information um, on the migration of the birds and where they go but um, we were particularly keen at Rutland Water to try and tag some young males to understand about their behaviour in terms of how they entered the breeding population but also obviously where they went during the winter so um we, with Roy Dennis's um, help, myself, Lloyd Park and Simon managed to catch 4K actually at on the Beaver Estate um, under licence. And that was when he was, um, how old was he then? Five years old. Five so years old yeah. He'd already done a few migrations, but he, he wasn't yet breeding. In fact, as we'll hear in a minute, it's taken 4K a few years to um, <laughs> finally find a lady, but he's done it finally at last. Um, in fact, it's had a pretty significant year this year, I would say. Um mm -hmm. Uh, but basically, that tag, which has now been working for five years, has given us the most fantastic information in terms of how he eventually joined the breeding population. But obviously, crucially for tonight, his migration and where he spends the winter. And Simon, what was so special for you then with his breeding? What, what, what was uh, what was different there? Oh, uh, well, I've had to be very patient. It's been uh, sort of uh, <laughs> Tim's been running sort of some sort of like uh, a, a, a counselling line really for me because there have been so many ups and downs we've seen so many different ospreys different females come through the nesting platforms ever since we uh, we tagged him first really and uh, and I never well I actually got to this year and I thought well it's not going to happen I just thought you know he's getting you know a little bit older and I thought well maybe you know he's seen plenty of females but they've all disappeared they've just sort of taken a fish off him and off they go back to Scotland and you think well here we go again and uh, I'd, I'd be on the phone to Tim and Tim say don't worry don't worry it'll happen it'll happen and uh, both Tim and John Wright when they first put the platform up they just basically said you know it won't be a matter of you know if it'll be a matter of when and uh, it could be you know one year it could be 10 years <laughs> and it's been somewhere in between the two so uh, it's, it's it's been a fantastic year i mean uh, you know, i never actually thought it would happen it was quite a, a, a very emotional year really to actually you know sort of uh, sort of finally see him breeding and i've been following you know up at the platform i've had over 100 visits to the platform this year just just watching and uh, and seeing what he's up to yeah, it's been an absolutely incredible story. Um, am I right in thinking it was the first time in in like more than two hundred years that they've been breeding there? 
Yeah, I mean, when I first, uh, yeah, I mean, Ospreys probably disappeared from this part of England probably in the late 18th century. That's what we think. We don't know exactly. So it's well over 200 years, we believe, since one are bred in, in this particular area at all. They've been passing through, but never actually bred, obviously, because they were, you know, uh, persecuted for such a long time, these birds. But uh, um, yeah, when I first moved into this area, buzzards were very rare. And now you've got buzzards, you've got red kites, um, and you've got an osprey. And uh, it's, it is unbelievable to, to, to actually walk out the front door and within two minutes see an osprey on its nest. It's fantastic. No, that's incredible. And it, a lot of it is also down to you because you put that uh, put the nest up in the first place. So thank you very much for doing that. <laughs> and then you Sasha, I mean? we're going to... Oh, sorry, Sam, carry on. Sorry, no, carry on, carry on. That's fine. Okay, Sasha, I was going to hand over to you because obviously um, the flight of the osprey is all about the migration of the ospreys um, and some of the threats and the challenges that they face along the way. Um, yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about how the idea was born to, to um, why the osprey was the focus here? Uh, yeah, okay, so uh, for, for those who don't know, in, uh, in 2016, 2017, I did a flight following the migration of Buick swans, and that gave us a whole new load of insights. We had lots of scientific information, but the fact that I could fly along with them and stop and land in communities all along the way and speak to people gave us a load more insights, not only into the different threats the birds face, but also it gave us insights into the sorts of communities that are involved, this, their life situations, um, what challenges they might have for conservation and more details. And we might know, for example, that swans are being shot, but unless you go to a town, you don't realise, or to a village, you don't necessarily know why. You might have a picture of what a hunter looks like, but in some communities, for example, we were talking to nine-year-olds who shoot to feed their family before school. So it helped us to paint a picture of the reality behind some of the conservation threats. Anyway, after that, I was made an ambassador for migratory birds and encouraged to do more. So we started looking at a map of, you know, what, what other species out there are doing um, interesting migrations and had a, had a potentially, you know, brilliant story behind it. And I guess whilst the issue with the swans was that the population was falling rapidly, um, uh, when I came across Roy and Tim and the Osprey story and realised there was... A, there was already a, a load of information behind the birds, um, uh, but it was a different one to the swans. The numbers weren't declining rapidly. Um, it was a reasonably positive story, but also one that was super optimistic. And that's really what I wanted to focus on, and a real conservation optimism story. As I think Simon has already mentioned, the population had you know, been decimated in previous centuries. And but with active conservation, you could actually bring back a breeding population and help it spread across Europe. So we already had we had a, a story, a basis for a story about um, which was very optimistic that if we actually take action, it makes a difference. Um, but there was still some um, pretty disheartening, I suppose, figures. Uh, from Tim McCreel's PhD, for example. And um, by the way, it is the most readable PhD I have ever read and was compulsory reading for all the team. Uh, I'd actually recommend it as bedtime reading, but not if you want to fall asleep. Um, so that, I mean, including things like, you know, 70% uh, or around 70% of the juveniles that leave the UK never make it back. So there was clearly, and, and there were the numbers of different habitats were pretty extreme. You're going from sort of northern Europe down through the Sahara and down into Africa. I mean, that's a, that's quite a colossal change. There's high mountains, there's um, low deserts and things. So really interesting story there. I knew there'd be lots of different challenges, different communities along the way. Um, and they could potentially benefit from the same sort of uh, model of conservation. So, yeah, that was basically it. And then I managed to meet up with Roy briefly at a Cayley. Um, and uh, we, we agreed to give it a go and have another meeting uh, a little bit later. Uh, I don't know if, if Tim has memories of that first meeting, which would have been quite radical. Someone saying, I want to fly with your birds. What do you think? Yeah, it was great. I, I remember you came up to, um, I was at Roy's in, in Scotland and, and you came along and we had a great chat. And it's just, I think what you do, Sasha, which is so unique is, you know, you really bring the story to life because we do know a lot about osprey migration through the satellite tagging work that's been done really since the late 90s. But I think 
you know, your work is so important because you actually get there, as you just said, with the Buick Swans, you get into the communities and you raise awareness of the of migration, my, migratory birds. And that is absolutely fundamental. If we're going to conserve these species, you can't just look at the breeding grounds. You have to look at their whole um, year, which involves the migratory flyway, but also where they spend the winter. So, mm. you know, it really just brings the whole story alive and, and adds so much extra information. And I think that's it, isn't it? It's, it's all well and good having the data um, and being able to go on Google Maps and that kind of thing to see it. But there's nothing that kind of takes away from being on the ground and, and then seeing the, the area for yourselves. And um, we've got a question coming through from Caroline. Um, and they're asking, if 4K satellite tag has already been on for five years, how much longer do you expect it to work for? Well, good question. I mean, the, the, the satellite tag that 4K uh, got on him is manufactured by a company called microwave telemetry who are based in um north america and they are very very reliable um roy fitted a similar tag to a golden eagle and i think it's been functioning for 12 years now um and the reason they've got such good longevity is they've got tiny solar panels on the upper side so as long as the bird is somewhere where there's sun then the batteries are charged up and therefore the tag hopefully continues to function um, and of course with an osprey the great thing is they spend as sasha now knows very well they spend their whole winter sitting on the coast in very sunny places so of course it means that the tags are topped up throughout the year um, because obviously when they come north to breed they're they're in the, they're here in the summer and so potentially it could it could work for another good few years yet um, and it, i think it just that longevity of data is so important because it really enables us to understand the individual um, individuals and how they kind of refine their migrations over successive years. You know where their favoured stopover sites and obviously where they're going for the winter because these adult birds are incredibly faithful to the same places. And, and we, the, way, the way that they're fitted, sorry, Tim, that means that they're, they're basically the feathers can be lost and regrow around them. Yeah, it's quite clever. Um, basically, it's a it's almost like a backpack. So it's a Teflon yeah. harness, which is um, well, that's proof we're live. Um, <laughs> um, um, it's a Teflon harness that's sewn with cotton, and basically the idea is that eventually um, that cotton will rot, rot, and when that cotton rots, then the tag naturally drops off. Um, and in fact, we, we tagged one at Rutland Water in 2013 and that tag stayed on, was on a bird called 30. Um, again, it just relates to her colour ring. And she went it on the coast of Senegal between Dakar and St. Louis. And her tag came off, I think, in the sixth year. Um, and it, actually, that one had just stopped functioning. So we weren't getting any data. And when she came back the next year, she came back minus the tag, which was perfect because it stopped working. But she was back and actually she's still breeding. She had another um, two chicks this year gone. So um, it, it really does enable us to follow th these individuals in such good, such close detail. And as part of, um, part of the information that you guys were sending us, which gave us incredible accuracy into exactly where 4K was. Um, Sasha, do you want to talk to us about the, the final push to, to go and, and see the exact area? Yeah, so I guess that's what this call is all about, right? So, I mean, I have not really practiced this, so I'm just going to gonna go for it uh, with giving you a bit of background and Cass going to add images, I think, where you can, right? Um, so, yeah, if, um, if you have any questions, please just, um, just throw, them, throw them at us. Um, okay, so I guess the, the start of it was, um, yeah, we had an idea where we were going to the Pongo River and near a town called Buffer. I had actually had to go back to the UK for um, for some issues to do with my legs. Oh, and the thing we haven't clarified, as I mentioned, the initial plan for this whole project was that I would be flying uh, with birds. And obviously, after the accident, I can't fly, but we still have managed to get an incredible response from communities without that, managed to get some amazing aerial views of everything through drones and things. So yeah, the expedition is pretty much gone as expected, just without the flying tech in it. Um, but yeah, I'd had to go back to the UK. So I came via the capital of Guinea, Conakry, and the expedition team had come from Guinea by road on what turned out to be 
I think has now been confirmed by others, probably the worst road in Africa. Um, <laughs> so I think I, uh, I feel I shouldn't be the one talking about it. So I don't know if any of the expedition crew are in this call and want to pipe up, but um, I um, have you got a picture, Kat, that I can show them? So we um, basically, in me going to Kanakri, I had, um, and being there beforehand, I'd had to have a few meetings with, with officials. We knew we had to have a, an official document called an Ordre de Mission, uh, in French, which was going to be given by the regional préfet, the, the boss of the region, um, and in collaboration with some conservateurs. So there's a department um, in Guinea, a department of the army, uh, which is for conservation. So it's people that wear military uniform, but their role is um, primarily conservation. Um, although they're clearly not particularly well funded, but we can talk about that in a bit detail later. Um, so yeah, I, I'd gone to Boffer to um, to chat to people uh, there, get all the official documents done. Um, but in meeting with the préfet and others, they had eventually said that actually they wanted me to. They wanted to meet not just me but the entire team. Um, and so, unfortunately, the team having having done the worst road in Africa, which was um, uh, pitted and full of red dirt. There was one stretch where they set off to cross a border and got almost all the way to the border and realized that actually the road was not a road. It was only passable by a motorbike because the um, the crossing of a river was done by canoe and there was no way that the land rovers were going to fit in the canoe. So they had to go back to that, take another bit of road. And I think, you know, a couple of hundred kilometers took four days or something like that. Um, but there I was sitting at the prefet's sort of official office with various military people around and lots of formalities. And um, the team were then asked to not, they couldn't just kind of go home. Um, they had to come in to meet everybody. And yeah, what turned up was a sight of like lots of stained orange people. Have you got any of the pictures? Uh, it's not letting me upload, but sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, it's all right. So they basically all looked like they had a bad fake tans because they were orange. Um, and they'd been sweating, and so the orange tan had sort of run in drips. Um, our our engineer, who has uh, white hair, had a big orange patch on the back of his head where he'd been underneath the vehicle so many times that he'd stained the back of his head orange. And um, as they walked up the stairs looking really kind of crestfallen and, and exhausted, um, all I could do was have fits of laughter. So it <laughs> really wasn't the best re uh re uh connection for the team but thankfully they took it all in good spirits and um and played the game had the meetings with different people uh eventually i was called back into the office with the um the prefet of the region his military uniform and we were being corrected many times uh on exactly the order at which i had to say things but through all of this and me uh obviously i i do speak french but the the guinean I suppose the vocabulary used and things are quite different. Expressions used are quite different. In fact, qu quite a lot of words I really wasn't following. And there's also some vague language used in some of the conversations. So when you're being asked to pay for something, it's not as clear as you must pay X for X there. And so I was I was struggling some of the time to understand the language. Not only that, there was um, the World Cup was playing on a television in the corner of the room. <laughs> So we had all we had all this to manage, but at least we could turn back to the World Cup if um uh if you know ever anything got heated and that was a that was a, a smooth a good way of smooth things over. Um so anyway, we eventually got our official paperwork and everything. And after all of that, whilst that was kind of tedious and not what you would have necessarily over here, or maybe not in the same format, um, as soon as the official sort of paperwork was done, or they they did actually eventually decide this was bigger than the region of Boffer and I had to actually go and speak to the uh, Minister for Environment, the Minister for National Parks and things in um, in the back in the capital Conakry which was tedious but eventually we um, got the paperwork and came back and as soon as we had that to show people and the right stamps on it um, they basically pressed a button and lots of things then uh, kicked into action which was great so the regional radio station turned up um, and recorded a couple of radio programs that they would run for several days to make sure that the villagers um, that we were going to visit knew that we were coming because we didn't necessarily want to surprise them. And one of the fishermen, I suppose, a chance to hear what we were, what we had to say. Um, the chef du port, so the port, the manager of the port, um, was sent off to try and find the best boat driver and the best boat, uh, boats, uh, motor, even the 
all the boats are basically a large version of a, of a canoe. They look quite handmade um, and needed to be motorized. It also needed to be of the kind of good quality. But we also need a boat driver who was going to be interested enough that he wouldn't leave us in the middle of the um, of the mangrove forest if he wanted to get home for dinner. Uh, and we knew that we, we needed at least two days. We might, might need three or four or five days. So it had to be somebody who was free to do that. So they, yes, they found someone who would do that. And then the representative of the mayors of the region also then had to come as soon as they realized this could be interesting. We then also had a representative of tourism and a few others. So we ended up, in fact, with a few, a few extras that I was worried wouldn't be conducive to a mission where you want to go and potentially use stealth on occasions trying to find um, a bird and the people that might get really bored of bird watching um, if you're not if that's not really your core activity um, but yeah they managed to do that find a boat and everything that was big enough and um, yeah we managed to set off the next day and I don't know if cats so you can can you set the play just a little video of me on the on the uh, edge of the port so this is it. This is our chance to find 4K. We have got a huge audience from the local community, all curious and also fascinated by the fact that we have come all this way, uh, in particular to find a single bird. And I think it's slightly incredulous that we are going to do it. Uh, but uh, hopefully, with the help of the locals and the fishermen, we're going to prove them wrong. So, yeah, in the background, you see a guy walking around in military uniform. He was our main contact there, a guy called al -Sani. He's one of the conservators. There was another woman called Fatu Mata, who was a lieutenant and uh, liked to wield that over people. Uh, if they, as soon as they assumed that as a woman, she didn't have any power. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, Fatu Mata, she, has, uh, she was bold. Um, and outspoken, um, but as Elsony, he was actually really interested in the birds. But the, both of them said, in fact, their whole department said um, that they actually none of them have any training in birds. Fatu Mata is responsible for all flora and fauna in the region. They had no idea that their region was a Ramsar site. Um, they have no books or materials, and yet yeah, they know nothing about birds or bird species or anything. So that was a little bit disheartening but what was really heartening was how Alcini like like really got into it he absorbed um what was being said he absorbed when we talked about kind of conservation issues in different places and by the end of it he was the one doing the radio and tv interviews uh, alongside me uh, in local languages as well so that was really that was really exciting anyway um so where are we up next day low tide so yeah it was low tide um i still had a boot on my leg and uh, was using crutches. So at low tide, anywhere in this region, high tide, you basically the water goes right up to the mangroves. At low tide, there's a massive soggy black mud bank to get through and trying to move crutches through that. You can imagine the crutches disappear into that kind of mud. Um, so, but yeah, at every place we had to do this, somebody managed to help. Uh, which was fantastic. Eventually managed to get into the boat and had, um, yeah, I had a moment where we were sitting in there. There was a, still this kind of mood from externals of like, this is a bit weird, these Europeans thinking that they're going to be able to find a single bird. They have no idea what the landscape around here looks like. But I then said, you know, oh, this is the kind of moment on Flight of the Swans where every time there was a moment of, of like massive doubt, um, a load of Buick swans would fly overhead. And then two minutes later, an osprey flew not only overhead, but close enough that I could point out like that's an osprey. You can see the sort of stripe on its eye as well. Um, so that was a nice, uh, a nice thing. And then the locals who were with us were going, OK, phew, we at least do have the kind of bird that they're looking for. So <laughs> they were they were really keen to please, which um, which was nice, but also also a bit of a challenge sometimes because people tend to tell you what you want to hear. Um, so we also had to kind of filter through that. Um, so, yeah, we set off in a boat. I don't think we've got any footage or pictures of boats, have we, Kat? Boat trips? No, you can't upload any of it. It's not letting you show the presentation either. Okay, so no worries. We set up in a boat. You can imagine it. it's a big wooden, big wooden canoe, but clearly it fits all our stuff in the middle of it and everybody around the outside. So it was reasonably big. Um, and we started an osprey count there. Um, I can't, I know that um, in the, 
the whole um, couple of days we were out there, we counted well, on a sorry a two hour stretch that we specifically looked at. We counted nineteen ospreys, but on this first hour, about eight or nine, and we were headed for a village called um, Dobure. Uh, I feel like we should already be uh, yeah maybe it's about the about the point to to link you back in Tim to figure out kind of you were kind of guiding us on how where we should start. Um, yeah, we yeah. what's that? No, carry on. Okay, great. So, yeah, we headed for a village called uh, Dobby Ray, which looked like it was the closest to where 4K was. Um, and, yeah, arrived. Have you got – you can't show the pictures, Kath, can you, of the the village of Dobby Ray? Okay, so you can imagine we were basically on the – headed down on the main channel and there were smaller channels into the mangrove forest. The channel we had to go up to reach the village of Dobby Ray is about sort of 30 metres across, maybe 20 metres across. Uh, and as we arrived, basically, there was a – we can only see sort of three or four huts, maybe four boats out the front, lots of fishing net along the whole the whole front of it. And a load of people there waving and waving us in, which was nice. So the radio message had worked, it had got out. Um, uh, yeah. Is that actually live, Kat, what I can see flicking on my screen? No. Is that shown to people? No. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that was a village of lots of, imagine lots of small huts, um, mostly tin roof with various bits of plastic and other things used to, to create the basis of it. Um, we were welcomed um, by a few people who I now know as the village chief and um, what they also have at Chef Dupont, um, various elders who we had to do a basic introduction to, show them our paperwork, and then we were led up to... Um, probably the best maintained part of the whole village, which was an enormous football pitch, a full-size football pitch out the back of it. And there was one television channel also playing um, of one little generator playing the World Cup. Um, so, yeah, that was, uh, that was pretty interesting. And the locals warned us about something called a rove beetle. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of a rove beetle before. Um, uh, are you able to show that, Kat? Yep. So, hey, okay. So this tiny little thing, like it looks a little bit like a small earwig. He looks enormous in that picture, but it's like a imagine a small earwig with these colours. Quite a lot of them crawling around different places. They seem to like to like go into shady bits, so shady places. So I ended up with a few in my tent on the first night, um, which was uh, interesting. But we didn't pay that much attention because we knew they didn't bite. But um, anyway, we just had a warning: look out for them. So um, and kind of you know get rid of them if they get, if they're on you. Um, and then, yeah, I had a chat to the um, the local villagers about what the local birthday celebration kind of technique was, what the kind of what they did on people's birthdays, because our team leader, Mel, who's Canadian, um, it was her birthday that night and none of us had prepared for it or done anything at all. So um, the chief said he'd go away and have a chat to locals and uh, and we would uh, we would see what would happen um yeah and then yeah in the middle of dinner that night um which was cooked for us by one of the local women um uh, suddenly um a whole group of people appeared um and thrust two juvenile palm vultures in my face which was quite um they're being like held by the held by the back of the wings i don't know if you can see in those pictures that they've had their both their flight feathers and their tail feathers cut off really short um and obviously kept like that and so that yeah they were basically being shoved in my face and I was like mm, what am I supposed to do here there wasn't anyone who could directly translate from Susu into French um at the time so we were left kind of going okay uh that's great and then carried on we clearly showed that that's not what we were interested in um and yeah so that was our first kind of crazy uh introduction I suppose to um the village of Dobere and before I go any further though we should link back to Tim and Actually, the, the next day's plan was to go out and try and find 4K himself. Um, but, yeah, how did you help us figure out what, where we should target? Yeah, I mean, the, the advantage we had, I mean, I say the advantage, I think what you're already explaining so well is how remote this place is. It wasn't an easy place to get to, clearly. <laughs> um, um, and, and you can't really tell that by Google Earth. You can kind of see it's a channel in the mangroves. But what we did have was that we've got really accurate GPS fixes from, from 4K every hour. So that basically shows his daily routine. And what it showed is that basically over the course of the winter, he since arriving and he arrived there in early October, he was living in an area of basically less than a square kilometre. Occasionally, as you can see on the 
on the map here, he was flying out into the main river mouth to presumably to catch fish. But this was not every day, just sporadically, um, normally in the middle of the day. But for the vast majority of the time, he was basically in three specific locations. And we know from the way ospreys live in the winter is that they, is that they are very predictable in how they live. So what I was able to do by looking at the data was to basically pin down, I thought, the three most likely spots where Sasha and the team would stand the best chance of seeing the bird. And the thing with this data is, although it is very accurate, it's not live. So basically what you're having to work from is, is the most recent update. And at this time of year, this tag, which is programmed before it's on the bird, it was only sending data every four or five days. So what that means is that all I could do is basically say, well, I think these are your best three most likely places. But I, I kind of thought, well, it's not guaranteed. You know, you might think, well, it's it's easy. You know where the bird is going to be. It actually doesn't play out like that. So I knew that, you know, you were going to need a bit of luck, really, Sasha, and skill <laughs> to um, <laughs> be able to... Um, to, to find the bird so yeah obviously that helped but you know you still needed to get there and you still needed to be in the right place yeah and uh, to be honest and uh, the skill was uh, was all in the locals so they did have uh, an amazing knowledge of the of the, the mangroves and the kind of the different channels and how they change over time as well so that was a uh, that was we knew we had that in our favor basically um, and the boat driver by this time had clearly showed he was from the village and he was clearly riveted by the whole mission and trying to learn as much as possible about uh, about the birds. So, yeah, we had that in our favour. Uh, so the next day we woke up and um, headed off. Was it this day or the next day that those little bugs attacked? I'm not 100% sure. I don't <laughs> think it on this. No, it wasn't on this first day anyway. So, um, yeah, we, we set off in the boat. Uh, again, low tide. It was a challenge to, to get me in there. But we had various people kind of um, providing arms that I could use um, and set off. And we set off up the channel again. We did another. Uh, did we count? No, we didn't count on this day. So we headed off, saw a couple of ospreys right at the very beginning of the trip, not 4K, didn't have any kind of uh, tag or anything on them. And then headed up to the point number one on the map. Um, I don't know if you can pull it up again. And uh, we were kind of moving slowly, looking very carefully. No ospreys overhead, nothing. Point number two on the map. Point number three on the map, also no birds. And by this time, the locals were definitely getting out their kind of cynical faces again and like, <laughs> nah, what? <laughs> the, I, I still, I still am not sure they completely understood what the, the how the GPS tag works or anything, or that you know I hadn't just like drawn this map for myself. Um, but yeah, um, point one, two, and three, and saw nothing. However, there was then suddenly a moment where a bird was spotted from behind flying away from one of those sites in the distance. And at that point, we were like, that's got the jizz of an osprey. Like, it really does look quite like an osprey. And a few photos were taken. We lately, later on looked back. But it was headed off into the mangroves. And so the boat driver offered to go up into some of the really tiny channels. And we're in quite a long boat at this time. Um, yeah, first first channel, nothing. Second channel, even smaller. And then I realized this was ridiculous because when you're in a small channel, you can't see it more than what's right next to you and what's directly above you. But they were they were putting in an effort. Um, and yeah, then we turned around and came back out and decided like basically the best thing to do was to go out into the main channel that was uh, again on that visible on that map and wait there for a while and see if we could see anything flying overhead. Tim's map had showed that there was um, sometimes 4K goes out to the sea to fish, but that tends to be uh, during the afternoon, I think you'd said. And we it was still in the morning, but we thought that was the best channel. Anyway, we um, moved back out there to the main channel and then... Um, yeah, thankfully, our engineer, Tim, who's kept our 4K, uh, sorry, our, our four wheel drive vehicles going the whole route, happened to be filming at the time when we spotted an Osprey. Now, Kat, do you reckon it's going to work to try and play this? My apologies. 
Kat thought this was a bit too rough to play with you, but it shows you the kind of nature of the boat. And there's a mixture. And of it also shows, yeah, it shows the feelings and emotions. Here we go. Oh, that's quite likely to be here. Can we not move? Can we just stop the boat? Stop the boat, stop the boat. Just. Arrêtez. Excellent. Okay. This is a keep really still, high chance. Keep still. Head out the way, Jason. Oh, it's your knee, bugger. Anyone able to get video? It looks like you might have a ring on it, sir. Right foot. Have you got a long limb? Oh, it's out. Are you still emotionally? I don't know if it's recording. Is there any way we can get closer? If you want to see it in a bubble, Jack. We'll drift slightly closer with the. Happy you can get slow motion if you feel like it. Yeah, okay. Moi, je suis uh, assez sûr que ça va être lui. Okay. I'm on his little bridge camera with a with a long <laughs> zoom on, trying desperately to capture it. But um, obviously, we're in a boat with people that aren't used to filming at all, and so you go and point to something, and everybody jumps up and and uh, runs to a side of the boat, and then the whole boat <laughs> is wobbling <laughs> uh, with cameras trying to film in. So yeah, that was that was our um, the the moment where we thought we were pretty sure that was going to be him. Um, and then yeah, um, Charlotte had managed to get a shot, so had a couple of others, and it looked like there was an antenna. So as we said, we it was a, at a rising tide at the time, so the boat we managed to leave the motor off and drift closer to 4K. And um, from there, the camera, the high res cameras with a um, in slow motion were able to get another recording. Oh wow! Um, <laughs> uh, well, that was a <laughs> that was a shot which said one hundred percent. This is four K. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but there is a there is a little bit of video as well, which was the a kind of moment where we could clearly see that it was him. So this is in slow mo, hence no audio. <clears throat> and whilst at that angle, it was completely invisible. I don't know if this is big enough on your screens, whatever you're watching on, but for anyone oh, who's watching, see, it. Screen, see I'm just back. Yeah. So that was it. Um, so at that point, there was lots of like, <laughs> there was lots of whooping and whooping and cheering and things going on, which was uh, which was pretty exciting. Um, and yeah, I didn't pull out the bit of video, but at that, um, the sort of there was the three kind of key people from the the village and the region. So the mayor at that point stood up in the boat, and at that point he announced that um, it was fantastic that they had a bird. And they, we'd found the bird, but the name was stupid. And could we change it? <laughs> <laughs> Who would think that 4K was a good name? And so <laughs> they had, they didn't exactly ask it to be changed, but they said the bird is now called Ile de Dobure, um, uh, which is the, the name of their village. Well, their village is called Dobure, and he was trying to name it the island of Dobure. And so I said it was a bit awkward to call a bird an island, uh, the <laughs> island of. So uh, if, if it could be Dobure, that would be a. Uh, that would be maybe more likely. Um, so yeah, anyway, they have asked if please the bird's name could be changed from 4K to WA. So that's uh, that's <laughs> that's TBD. I don't know what either of you think of that. Well, perhaps Dobby for sure, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it works for me, it's definitely easier. Uh, I don't know if there are any Osprey fans that are uh, watching that have, a, have an opinion. I guess you'll call it whatever makes most sense to you, but um yeah that was that was all um that was all pretty exciting um so where are we at now um oh yeah that night celebration of mel's birthday i yeah that was all that was pretty amazing suddenly um a load of women appeared from so the small there's a the village that, of dobby ray what we had seen was i don't know maybe 20 30 sort of small huts and a couple of little toilet um sort of enclosures um and then um and then there was a football pitch and the corner of the football pitch had a tiny bit of signal so we knew people were walking over there for that but it turns out then if you carry on the track behind there there's actually a, a bigger and uh yeah a, a, another bigger section of the village which had palm plantations and a few other things 
Um, so yes, yeah, some women appeared out of there all dressed up. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that a lot of people seem to wear when they're dressing up is um, woolly ski hats. So bear in mind the temperature we had there. People came dressed in all kinds of stuff with a microphone and a, um, a machine to play music, whatever you call it these days. Um, I was going to, yeah. Um, and yeah, they basically put on a dance, a uh, full on dance with um, lots of uh, twerking and all kinds. I'm sure it went up in the film. Mel is um, absolutely loved it from what I could see, but she was being encouraged to dance and that's not her comfort zone whatsoever. But we all played along. I managed to get up on my uh, on my funny legs and boogie for a little bit, but um, it was definitely, um, it definitely, yeah, a, a load of fun. Um, so yeah, that was that. Um, next day, so having found 4K, um, that was brilliant. We, but we also really wanted to make sure we'd um, spoken to the locals, and we knew that um, WA is quite a small village, and the village of Saka is um, much bigger, and there's more fishermen there, and there are fishermen who who fish all the way up the rivers normally with just paddles and others who go out to sea. So we wanted to go out and meet them as well. We did another count um, on the way, counted nine or ten ospreys on the way to that village. Um, and, yeah, uh, it's a pretty beautiful village. It's along a beach front, so it's one of the un unusual in the areas, having a long, long beach front, so sand most of the time. Again, we arrived at low tide, so there was a load of mud. Um, but this time, rather than having to use planks and different things to get me off so my crutches would work, um, as they had an 18-year-old lad come out and um, <laughs> lift me up. And if anyone doesn't know me, I'm not light. I'm not a lightweight uh, woman um and so yeah he picked me up out of the boat but also picked up um tim and maybe somebody else as well uh but yeah they've been waiting for us since the since the night before and um yeah so we were basically taken directly to a sit in a group and uh meet the elders and describe to them again our project um so yeah uh we shared what it was about and at the end got this kind of message from the chief. Can you, could you play that? So just, this is the only time he spoke English and he put in a real effort to speak English because most of our group doesn't speak French. Um, so do your best to interpret it. You feel from Mankwi, you feel from Rodongwe, you say not Rodongwe, I don't know my film number. I look documentary, one of the telemanagi, Nadali say Rafi, Rusala, Napoli. Angle, Guinea, um, a beat of one here, a beat of a friend. Let us not forget that we here, we shall do try small, small, you know? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so I hope you get the general sentiment of it. They basically said in quite sort of detail that they are, you know, they are not active i suppose in conservation they're focused on you know what they're eating tomorrow they don't have many resources um but now that they know that there's a connection between us uh anglais and guinea is obviously england and uh, and guinea and we won't forget each other and they will try small small which means they'll do kind of what they can um and we're really looking forward to seeing the film so um that um that's at least a good start uh with uh with the community we then went to various fishermen. I um, don't know if we've got some picture, I think, of the of the fishermen. So interestingly enough, one of the fishermen mentioned that there were he's seen another uh, osprey, but I guess I have to be careful with this because there is no local word for osprey. All the birds of prey seem to they seem to use the same word. Um, so the, he mentioned another. Uh, well, he said he thought was an osprey um, with a blue ring on it that had been seen closer. And um, But he also mentioned that he was aware of at least two occasions where a bird had been, a large bird had been caught in fishing nets. Um, and he said that he thought they'd been released on both occasions. So, um, but at least, yeah, they were, they were interested in um, what we had to say. Yeah, this was the exact, the, the guy that I was speaking to. Uh, yeah. So we then visited the school, and it's a kind of school as you would imagine. As you walk walk through the village, they um, again had um, a couple of places because this was a village of a couple of thousand people. There's a couple of places where the World Cup was showing, and it costs you about twenty p because it costs someone electricity. It costs you about twenty p to go and watch a game, um, and yeah, also if you there's so little power in the area that most people do have a mobile phone, but there's 
I think we we passed probably three different little shops that basically just have a million charging cables and you go and just charge your phone there. There we are. Um, this is a common uh, local business. Now I went from there to the um, yeah to the local school. They have no resources really that we could see apart from a chalkboard um, with some basics written up there. I'm not sure that the, what's on the chalkboard changes very um, often. Um, one teacher looked pretty um, overwhelmed, this lady that's kind of a third from the right. Um, and the younger kids do school in the morning and the older kids go in uh, in the afternoon from what I could understand. But um, they were super keen, super interested. And um, by this time, Al Sani, who I mentioned earlier, he's the guy on the right, he was fully absorbed in the story and sharing it with everybody. And um, he um, taught them lesson number one in uh, osprey conservation uh, and uh, I suppose interacting with us, hopefully in the future. Can you play that short video, Kat? Right. They did. They did have a much, a much longer uh, presentation from the others about um, also from the Minister for Tourism. He also got really excited about it. So he gave them a spiel as well. So, um, yeah, that was basically the kind of the 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 story of our short time on the in the Pongo River Basin finding 4K and the people we met along along the way. Um, next steps for us is uh, obviously turning the whole story into a film. And uh, yeah, trying to digest all the different things learned from different partners and um, figure out what would be the kind of most useful next steps. Um, and so that fits quite nicely, actually, Sasha, because we've had a few people asking um, who, are, who are new and have um, just discovered us uh, pretty much today by the sounds of it. Um, and they're loving the show and they're saying, Will there be a documentary showing the full story of the flight of the Osprey? Um, and I guess I would suggest as well, maybe giving some ideas of uh, when that would be coming out. Uh, there will be a full film. And if we can do a bit more fundraising, hopefully there'll be a, sh a showings of the film um, as we drive some of the vehicles back from, back from Guinea next year. The film should be finished by the end of April. So we've got to really pull our fingers out to get that done. So by the end of April, um, that should be finished exactly how, we haven't sort of got a full plan for um, what the showings are, but I'll certainly be speaking to Tim and Simon to try and pull together any ideas for how we should do that for, for best effect. I also, there were lots of occasions along the expedition where um, industry could and should be uh, involved. And so we'd like to engage them a bit more because there are places where actually they could make some small changes and make a big difference. And I'm not talking just making a donation of some kind, but actually in a, some sort of change in activity. So, yeah, that is all going to be um, put in place. But, yeah, the film hopefully will show the real, well, the journey of the Ospreys from their point of view, um, but also show the heart of all the different, people trying to conserve uh, ospreys uh, along the route we've had um we've had a few questions actually that kind of feed into that um which i'll get to in a minute but i'm also quite conscious of time but um simon and tim that i'd love to know what your thoughts are <laughs> having seen the um seen the footage well that, that's the first time i've seen it so um i'd, I'd heard rumors but uh <laughs> under wraps until today so it was uh yeah it was it was amazing it was just so emotional to see it, you know, three, three and a bit thousand miles away. And, uh, you know, he's created a link between a small village in, well, not even a small village outside of a small village in Africa and, uh, and the Vale of Beaver, you know, it's, yeah. it, it, it is, you know, gobsmacking to think that the team could have tracked him down. I've, I've just literally got to jump in my car and three minutes I'm, I'm up at the platform. <laughs> you had a much tougher <laughs> journey. <laughs> I had the easy job really, to be honest, to monitor him from this end, but, uh, no, I just want to thank the team um, immensely for doing it because uh, Tim and I, well, Tim will tell you himself, but I was never never that confident you were ever going to track him down, to be honest. But uh, so you've done a fantastic <laughs> job. Thank you. Yeah, I totally agree, Simon. I think um, 
you know, you see you, your video is great because it, you know, that moment when you're on the boat and you see the bird for the first time, it's so exciting. Um, and I think the power of birds to, to link people across the world is just, is just incredible. You know, I mean, I know like there's some football shirts as well. So football does it as well, but <laughs> I won't mention that too much, but, but I just love the fact that, you know, that bird flies from rural Leicestershire to the mangroves of Guinea and links people in the in the way it does um yeah. and i think the fact that you know you're you've been to the community you've clearly you know interested them in conservation they won't you know it's clearly not going to be at the forefront of their mind but it just you know it's that kind of work that is so important as i said earlier for the protection of migratory birds so yeah just amazing efforts asher i, I can see that was not an easy place to get to so <laughs> i think you just did so well um to do it it could have been worse, to be honest. At first, we looked at it and thought, is this going to require trying to get out and wade through the thickness <laughs> of a mangrove forest with all its entangled roots and mud? And uh, thankfully, it didn't make us go that far. We've got a, um, a question come along from Caroline, and uh, she's asking, now the villagers are more aware of the birds and the interest in them, do you think they will now be more careful to release birds if they get caught? I, I mean, we've definitely made a stir. We were probably the strangest thing that's happened to those villagers in a very long time. So they definitely will have talked about it. And there were, we had to have the conversation many times with them because people would say, oh, have you managed to catch it? Um, or they'd see a picture of our vehicle and say, like, Are your, is your vehicle full of, of birds? Thinking that we were on a collecting, some sort of collecting trip. And we had to repeatedly say, no, we just want to film it. And then I kind of realized what they, what they really kind of, uh, got was the idea that what we really wanted to do was kind of look after it because every year that 4k does this migration we get a bit more information on the sites is using everything so it's really important that that stays um and uh yeah so there was um so yeah i definitely think that there will be talk about it it will um be considered and people repeatedly said what would you like us to do and my main my main answer was yeah stay away from you know it, it don't necessarily try and disturb it um but also the big risk is yeah um discarded net and being trapped in it so they got that but it is true they haven't got any way of processing or recycling or disposing of that kind of net so that is a problem not just there but everywhere what to do with the net there's no plastic in most of guinea there's no rubbish collection whatsoever and that was the same in many countries in West Africa. And you know, small attempts at projects which can take in different forms of plastic, but that's definitely got to be a, a major thing for the for the future. Um, finding a way of of dealing with it. I mean, this is one of the pictures of Dobby Ray as we uh, as we arrived. They um, they keep a lot of plastic bottles because they reuse it for putting fuel in. People buy fuel in small quantities most of the time, or they make juices and things and use the bottles but there's a lot of waste um and a lot of plastic and that's where it ends up but eventually ends up in rivers apart from around the village though in most of this area there was very little plastic debris so i guess once it's washed out of there i'm guessing it's mostly going out into into the ocean but um, most of the area where 4k was there was no sign of plastic but there is around anywhere where there's a settlement you can see the discarded net there um, it looks like it's not intentionally being thrown into the sea, but it's, you know, left by the by the water's edge. So that is a thing to be dealt with. We have a question coming from uh, Junkin or JJ as we know him. Um, he said, did you guys have time to check the other osprey with the blue ring that the fisherman was talking about? We didn't. Um, that is definitely something to look out for in future. Uh, but no, we um, we didn't manage to on this occasion. And then we've got another question coming through from Tiger, which I think is uh, is quite a good question and get people talking. Um, he's saying many people are anti anti tracking. He's hugely pro tracking. What's the thing most in favour of tracking? Mm, can I hand that over to Tim and Simon? Yeah, I mean, I I know there are people who. Who, who don't agree with it but I think um, the results speak for themselves I mean 
uh, you know, without wishing to labour a point, um, from a conservation point of view, the fact that you can demonstrate to some of these communities the journeys that birds like an osprey is making, um, and the fact it's flying from northern Europe, it's flying 3,000 miles to get there, that, that is just so powerful. So aside from all the scientific and the kind of academic value we get from the satellite tags, for me, almost the most important thing is the links that it can make with local communities. And I think, as I said earlier, what, what Sash has done is, is brilliant in the sense that those people in that community are now aware of the need to conserve birds because of 4K, because 4K is there. And the reason we know he's there is because he's got a satellite tag. Uh, mm -hmm. And that satellite tag has not impeded him in any way. You know, he came back and he bred for the first time this, this year, raising two chicks. So, you know, the amount of information we can gain from that mm -hmm. one bird is, is incredibly powerful. And you have to think that really the osprey is a flagship species because there are many thousands of migratory birds who do the same kind of migration every year from the UK to the west coast of Africa but we simply in many cases can't tag them because they're too small or you know it's just not feasible so you know the osprey is a real flagship for conservation and again I think that's another thing that the expedition's done so well is to is to really highlight that so um yeah I just I yeah <clears throat> Sorry, can I also add that um, the even like some really specific information on the way. So Tim was able to show that um, show me that looking at the looking at the tracks from this year and from previous year, you can actually see ospreys in the desert landing on power, like landing on um, electricity pylons. And we've got so another bird uh, tagged at the moment, which is not only using uh, stopping at pylons or being attracted to pylons. Um, but also spending time around turbines. Now, the power that that has for me when I'm speaking to industry is huge. I'm not like vaguely saying, oh, we know the birds leave and they must be going through this general area. Um, we can show people points on a map and it's, um, it's moving to people. So um, that's another really kind of specific example where, um, it, yeah, it helps us engage um, also with, with industry. And then if somebody there wants to start a conversation, they're not doing it on a vague gut feeling of Tim McCrill, con Osprey lover. It's, um, it's on data that's come from a, from a, from a machine. So, yeah, it's been I mean, really powerful. The other, the other thing from a, from a UK point of view is obviously with the data that Tim's provided us on 4K specifically in the area here in Leicestershire, we can see how far he's going. And part of the my personal sort of hope is that we can get to a situation where the, the central, you know, first translocation point for ospreys starts to keep on spreading out from that point. And we can see where the osprey is going to. We can see how far 4K is going forward uh, north of, of the nest site here. So if we can try and get some other platforms further north, then, you know, wouldn't it be great to see ospreys nesting in every single county of England, for example? You know, um, you know that would be fantastic. And Tim's obviously done some fantastic, fantastic work in Pool Harbour. And, uh, you know, but but it's it, that sort of data is, you know, is really, really, you know, like gold dust because it just helps you to understand where we can home in on. Where should the next platform be then? Where do we think we could get another um, pair of ospreys to nest? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, Sasha, you're talking about um, the pylons there. We've actually had quite a few questions about that as we've been talking, but I feel that needs like a whole um, kind of separate yeah. uh, interview so we can go a bit more deeper into that and the impacts and the changes that we want to see here. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We've had such lovely support as we've been talking. Lots of people really fascinated by the journey. Very happy that you got to see 4K as well. Obviously, that was that was never a given. Um, so it's incredible that you managed to do so. Um, so we're just about to wrap up now. Is there anything you guys want to say before we say goodbye? Uh, well, I just I'd just like to thank Sasha for and and the team um, and yourself, obviously, Kath, and the whole team for everything you've done uh, all the way down to Africa. Um, but you know, I'd, I'd also like to thank Tim for the amazing work he goes you know, he goes through, which is probably a lot of it. Um, untalked about and unsaid but uh, you know I'm just one volunteer a small cog in a very 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 big program but uh, um, just to plug I'm planning to write a book on 4k's life story so uh, um, that'll be for raising money for charity some charitable uh, causes so uh, um, hopefully we can we can get you to to pin on an epilogue at the back end of his successful breeding about his journey down mm -hmm. to Africa but uh, I'd just like to thank all the professionals and all the volunteers out there who do all this fantastic work and just realize that there is hope 
you know, if if people do focus, there is hope out there. As I say, in Viva, we didn't used to have red kites. We didn't used to have buzzards. We didn't have an osprey. Uh, even thanks to Tim, we had a white-tailed eagle um, visit the estate in 2021, I think it was. But, uh, you know, and uh, so there is hope if we can focus. I think that's a really important point, actually, Simon. And, you, you know, you deserve credit as well for, you know, helping us find those spots for those nests and talking with all the local people which is so important and it you know we talk about we're talking about talking to local people in in west africa well things are definitely not perfect in the uk either there's a lot of work we need to do here as well so and you know you're at the forefront of that for us so you know thank you for that but yeah sasha just brilliant what what an amazing journey um and i think in particular i think we've got to a shout out to those guys going along those roads in Guinea. That sounds yeah. absolutely horrendous. So that just makes it even more, um, you even more deserving of the the accolades you should get. So yeah. So um, yeah. I think I think tomorrow's yeah. episode of um, the radio program, oh, our radio program on uh, Radio Four, um, will include some detail. I think about that about that road. So um, yeah. Uh, anyone who's interested uh, should listen along. And yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the for the inspiration to do it in the first place. Um, yeah, Sasha, there's two there's two things that we need to wrap up. One, we need to talk about these insects very quickly oh. about why why you needed oh. to mention them oh, because, uh, because I think people will be in for a bit of a shock. I don't know if uh, you you noticed in the couple of pictures of meeting with the uh, villagers, my face looks a bit different. This beetle releases a fluid from it that is worse than cobra venom, and it burns your skin. And because it goes into cozy places, I managed to get them like on my eyelids while I was sleeping. Wow! <laughs> and uh, uh, I think there's even there's even uh, worse pictures out there. So that happened to me and to Charlotte, and everybody else had them in other parts of their body. So. Mel had got her neck. She looked like she'd um, had to spend an evening with a vampire. Um, but everybody, everybody was covered in those. So the people in the village of Saka had to greet, uh, had to greet us all with different marks. But at least they they know the um, they know this beetle, and so they were pointing at it and going, "Ah." <laughs> You see, that's something you can't tell by looking at Google Earth. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't have been able to tell. Uh, and the second and thing. Then the other and the other thing I was going to ask you about was the vultures. What was the situation with those? Oh, so the palm vultures were, um, yeah, so they were being shoved in my face. They were actually being offered to us. And when I eventually got, um, so one of the guys who came out with us um, basically kind of got through the telling us what we wanted to hear piece. And um, and he basically said, look, with normally wild birds are only of interest as food. And um, so when they have an opportunity to get a couple of young vultures, they will. And they have two value for them. One of them is occasionally white people come along and will buy birds of prey. And so they're kind of hoping that maybe we might be interested in buying them. But secondarily, if nobody does, then they will just eat them like chickens. So they will just eat them as food. Um, so that's interesting. It also um, ties in with the comments from a couple of kids in Dobira when I said to them, you know, what do you think of wild birds and birds like the osprey? And their answer was, they scratch your eyes out. Um, and at that point, I was like, what a weird, what a weird thing to say. And I said, I don't think you'll find an osprey getting anywhere near close enough to you to scratch your eyes out. And then the same guy said, no, but the only time they see them up close is when we've caught them to potentially eat them. So that's when they are uh, going to be uh, in full fight mode. So that was that was pretty fascinating. And also, but it also helps us to paint a picture of, you know, the, the background of the, the people who are we're relying on to conserve our sprays the other end of the flyway. Um, but yeah, definitely got a good basis for um, for uh, working with them in future. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, guys, for coming on and taking the time to share your stories and for all the help that you guys both gave us as well um, along the expedition, um, helping us to track him. So we wouldn't have been able to do it without you. So thank you to you both. Um, but yeah, for now, I'm going to wrap up. So um, I'll say goodbye and everyone can enjoy the rest of their day. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks Bye. Thanks, everybody.